Hello, hello. This is the era of sequels and low effort. I have a new idea when nostalgic customers will pay for an old idea. Why risk a new brand when you can put out a new idea into an existing one? Also, why make a fancy video when you can talk over Final Fantasy VII footage? This brings us to today's video, where we talk a bit about the question, can you ruin the original? First person video context, I live in the area that the Quad State Tornado, as it's being called currently, tore through recently. It thankfully did not hit our pathetic little village directly. It did, however, knock out power and the phone lines to this entire part of the state for a week, and did some lightning damage. The phones still barely function, and power lines are still being re-erected. The incredibly expensive yet horrendously bad clown car internet that I have to pay for was also directly hit by that same tornado, so I can't actually upload this video yet. For the past few months, I have been streaming on Twitch every day or two, more or less, for a while, and when the tornado hit, my options for making content of any kind dropped to zero. I was able to use a gas-powered generator to get my Cintiq working long enough to draw a new Sonic IDW character in the dark, put the picture on my phone, and then slowly upload it over LTE to Twitter. But also, my brother contracted COVID at work and brought it over to us, because he's the dumb one. You could tell he had been carrying it for a while because I found him unconscious outside my door. My mother and father, both over 70 years old, also contracted it. I'm having to rewrite this portion of my explanation because my father went from moaning in pain for two weeks and saying he didn't know if he would make it, to outright screaming and calling out to Jesus because his intestines had burst. My whole family, besides me anyway, are all anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theorists, as you may have guessed. They also don't know how to sort through citation or what the value of peer review is. The cherry on this doo-doo Sunday is that they also believe that hospitals are part of some sort of secret cabal that wants to murder them by getting them onto ventilators. And so none of them wanted to accept help of any kind, until I, the quiet one, started screaming at them at the top of my lungs that they were going to do what I told them to and take my dad to the hospital. Please get vaccinated. I'm not going to argue with you about the thing you read online. But as I said on Twitter, the biggest problem I have with all of this isn't the damage you do to yourself, or to me, or even everyone around you that you purport to care about. It's that we are what we leave behind. And the foremost memory I have of my relatives, my father especially, isn't going to be their positive traits. It will always be their irrational fear-mongering and terror of the unknown. But since I'm vaccinated and don't believe in hospital warlocks, I just felt particularly snotty for a couple days and my sleep got a little bit weird. I'm single, have no kids, and my entire familial line is unreliable, so this December has been... It's been a shitty December. And November. December is usually shitty for some reason. But I've definitely felt isolated, imprisoned, and like my life will just keep getting worse until I die one day in the far future my body never found by anyone because I left no one behind in my personal life that cared if I was even alive. Good times, these 2020s. Love it. It's great, isn't it? Point being, during this video, if you're wondering, why is it mostly just unedited footage of Final Fantasy VII? The answer is my options are limited, and that's what was installed locally on my computer when the internet died. Also, I have a series called Little Gripes that are mainly this anyway. Me doing talkies over the walkies while you look away, keys. A walkies. Milwaukee's. While I don't know what's in the future, I know this. I still have the power to pretend to be a pretentious twat for your entertainment. And that's the real reason you're subscribed. In the process of playing a texture modded FF7, I recalled some vague memories of playing the game as a teenager. I'm not a nostalgic person, I have a pretty bad memory for most things, mainly because I don't think about the past too often. The most important factor in having a good memory is recalling information about them consistently. Some people with amazing memories think of it as a sort of disease because they can't escape thoughts about them. Uh, not me. 
I think about stuff, money, cute girls in my rapidly increasing age, and furries. You know, adult stuff. It's probably the one thing that keeps me sane-ish. While trying to escape my current tornado virus reality by playing FF7, I also started thinking about Final Fantasy VII colon remake. I can't call it THE Final Fantasy VII Remake, since as most of us probably know by now, it's not actually a remake. It's a bizarre, time-traveling sequel about how much Sephiroth wants to kiss Cloud, and how marketable the past is, and how terrible fan fiction can be. I won't have any remake footage in this video, both because... maybe I can't, and also maybe because looking at it makes my skin crawl with... other memories. What is the opposite of nostalgia? I have that. Cringe? Anyway. When I stream myself drawing at twitch.tv slash plague of gripes, I usually listen to video game music, since we live in a DMCA hellhole. I have FF7 music and remake music on my playlist, which is mildly painful. Anytime I hear a track from the original, I think both, I like this song, followed by God damn it, Remake. When I hear Remake music, I think, this sounds like overproduced Super Monkey Ball music sometimes. And also, God damn it, Remake, you could have been so much better. Point being, it's hard to only play and experience the original without having to think about Remake in some way. This is why I started thinking about the corporate ability to destroy our childhoods, and even if that's possible. I've heard it stated many times over my centuries of walking this earth that the first one will always be there, or it can't ruin the original. Especially in modern life, this sentiment crops up quite often since remaking original ideas is so prevalent, and completely shitting the bed while trying is equally prevalent. So while lying in bed, sick, unable to communicate with the outside world, alone, somehow both sweating and freezing in the dark at the same time, I started thinking up examples of old series with sequels or remakes that I could list out and discuss. Gotta make content. There's actually tons of them, so I decided to limit it to my favorites. Quote unquote, favorites. The most interesting ones for me to think about off the top of my head were Final Fantasy VII, of course, and Dark Souls, and Star Wars. These are all interesting in that they have the same general issue with sequels, but in totally different ways. They also all had definitive genre-altering original releases, so let's go in reverse. You're probably thinking of Star Wars in a different way than I am. Some of you are thinking, yeah, Disney ruined that franchise. Some of you may be thinking, yeah, the prequel trilogy ruined that franchise. I'll tell you, I'll I'll tell you what I'm thinking. The first movie is completely different from the rest of them. Star Wars itself, the movie retroactively called The New Hope, was even a completely different idea than its subsequent iterations. There was a war just prior to the movies called The Clone Wars, but there was no clue what it was about. It was just a campy-sounding throwaway line that was just written, you know, just to sound campy and fun. Most of the original guesswork by comic and book writers in the 80s was that someone was fighting a bunch of ugly cloned monster people. Darth Vader wasn't called Darth Vader when Palpatine gifted him a new name and title that the Sith historically used since the days of Darth Bane, and the Sith were their own species from another planet, and the Jedi were... Th th no, none of that was true. No, Obi-Wan calls him Darth because that's his first name in Star Wars. His dumbass father actually named him Darth. How embarrassing. He also wasn't Space Jesus. He was just some idiot that was working as one of the Emperor's goons. He had a red lightsaber because a lightsaber was a weapon used by the Jedi. And he was a naughty Jedi who betrayed them. And the Jedi were a religious order that almost no one knew had ever existed. They weren't galactic leaders. They certainly weren't generals. By the time we roll around to the third movie, obviously a lot of that had changed or solidified. But even Sidious didn't use a lightsaber. That was a Jedi weapon, after all. Use your Jedi weapon. Strike me down. 
kiss me under the milky twilight, you know, all that stuff. Point being, Star Wars as a concept seems to radically change pretty often. Now, there are all sorts of video game rules to everything, and people have three hour long video dissertations on the nature of the Force and how it relates to the father, the daughter, and the son, and how the story the mother may fit into that within Disney canon as opposed to Legends canon, which itself was soft canon within the books compared to the canon of the movies and the even softer canon of the games, or the fanon of the Star Wars zeitgeist, and so on. It's a mess. It's always been a mess. However, can you imagine if Star Wars 2, The Empire Strikes Back, had never been made? What if Star Wars remains Star Wars? Not A New Hope, no sequels ever made, no books were ever made, no official follow-up of any kind was ever made, and the only actual information we ever had the go-off of had been the original first film. How radically different would people perceive the universe? Luke wouldn't have a father, at all. He certainly wouldn't have a sister. Fanfiction may actually have paired Luke and Leia together pretty often. Our concept of what the Empire even was may be totally different. A massive chunk of what we take for granted as facts about the universe wouldn't exist, and we may have weird theories linking together Star Wars with George's older and later movies he may have made. My point here isn't that the world would be better or worse. You can continue on and complain about the prequels or sequels if you want, but that's not the important takeaway for me. The most important thought is that regardless of your opinion of what comes after the original, they unconsciously shape how people view the original story. It becomes almost impossible to view the story the same way you would have when you first experienced it when it came out. Now let's take Dark Souls, for example. Yes, and yay! Insert child scream dot wave here. Uh, I have two really long Dark Souls playthroughs on my channel where I wander around talking about the lore and the way the content was designed and other horse hockey like that. So the people that are used to watching that are going to be real excited now. So prepare for this bit of me explaining it uh, in a very annoyingly long way. Sorry. When it comes to Dark Souls 1 concepts, I'd consider myself somewhat of an expert. Somewhat. For Dark Souls 1. The actual Dark Souls 1. You see, Dark Souls 2 altered a lot about how people think of one in the same way Star Wars changed as a concept over time. Dark Souls 3 did that even more. I'll use the biggest example. One of the big mysteries of Dark Souls 1 is what the undead curse is. People are mysteriously turning into zombies. As one, you're tossed into the undead asylum. You're later coerced by B Big Snake Man into getting stronger to link the flame and carry on Gwen's will. A lot of players will finish the game, watch themselves get engulfed in fire, and have no idea what just happened. Most of the story is fairly literal. Not much of it is cryptic. It's just piecemealed out into a lot of different item descriptions. The more of them you read, the more it makes sense how all this stuff works, as long as you remember it. Here's how it works. Hollowing in Dark Souls 1 isn't actually a curse. There's a logic to it. There are four Lord Souls that sort of govern the way reality works. They all were found by little naked men in something called the First Flame. There's the souls that the Witches of Isleth have. You could call it the Life Soul. It's associated with fire and creation. The Witch of Isleth tried to use her ability to make stuff to make another First Flame, but it didn't work, and that's where demons in the Bed of Chaos come from. Its opposite is something you could call the Death Soul. That's what Nido is. As far as anyone can tell, no one has a Death Soul besides Nido if he's alive at all. He is just a pile of skeletons, after all. And all his servants are also skeletons who originally dropped zero souls whenever you killed them when the game came out. There's no life there. There are also necromancers down in his tomb, but they may just be invading humans who are trying to use his power as their own. It's kind of vague. But yeah, death. He's associated with death and disease and endings, as opposed to the life soul ability to create things. And of course, there's the dark soul, which is also called humanity. That's the one humans have, and it's what makes them human. 
It's associated the most with the physical world. Magic based off of it is physical in nature. It's so physical that when you find humanity wandering around without fleshy people around them, they look like little black bedsheet ghosts with cute little eyes. They don't hate you. They envy you for being people, and they try to fly into your body. But since they're physical in nature, they end up hurting you in their attempt to find love. Humanity. You see where that idea goes, right? It's very poetic in that way. There's also the souls that the gods use, which you could call the light soul, as it's dark's opposite and all about the sun. It's more associated with the non-physical, enlightenment perhaps. These two souls are linked. When one is strong, the other is weak. And the stronger the first flame is, where all these souls come from, the stronger the light soul is. When the flame grows dark, the dark soul grows stronger. That's why when they, the little pygmy guys, found the first flame, Gwyn managed to gain control over the world, challenge the dragons, and essentially enslave humanity into believing he was their god. Meanwhile, the original Dark Soul picker upper, called the Furtive Pygmy, was easily forgotten. In Dark Souls 1, the first flame started dying down because it was running out of energy. One of the core lessons of the first game is that energy is finite, and all things end. When the Light Soul started waning in power, and the gods started getting weaker, the Dark Soul got stronger. Now, in, in, with the gods getting weaker, the undead curse happened. There's no such thing as the curse, of course. There's no curse at all. As the Dark Soul and humanity got stronger, the physical nature of the Dark Soul increased in power. So when people died, instead of staying dead, their bodies would reform in Estus, a fire-like substance that pours out of burning souls in humanity. It's the stuff you see in bonfires. That's not actually fire, it's Estus. It's sort of the building block to reality, I suppose. And the thing in the middle is just an iron poker to stoke the fire. It's not a fucking coiled sword. Why would it be a sword? Anyway. As the first flame weakened, the Dark Soul increased in power, causing humans that had the Dark Soul to lose the ability to die outright. Their bodies would simply reform in Estus, this source of power and life, but they would lose a little bit of their humanity in the process of that happening. Over the centuries, their only way to die would be to be killed by someone, or something, or just by accident. And the more that they were killed, the more of that original humanity, the Dark Soul, they would lose. Eventually, they would die too much, lose too much of themselves, and become what is known as a Hollow. A Hollow is basically one of those little pygmy creatures from the opening cutscene that has enough of a soul and memory inside of it to desperately want to be a person again. Sort of like those humanities I mentioned earlier. That's why they attack you and not one another, presumably. Because they want what you have. That's also why the undead problem got so bad. At first, it was just a few people who miraculously came back to life and would live for centuries as heroes. But the more people that became undead, and the more wars and problems happened in the world, the more likely they'd keep getting killed. They would reappear near their homes and families and neighbors, and once one of those people was too far gone to remember themselves, you get an unstoppable zombie outbreak that snowballs into a massive problem because they just keep killing ordinary people, and those people would in turn also perhaps become undead and continue to exacerbate the problem. Gwyn wasn't naturally going hollow. He was literally burning his own light soul at the first flame in an attempt to stop the Age of Dark from happening. When the gods started getting weaker and humans got stronger and the first undead breakout happened, and when the Witch of Isleth accidentally turned into a terrible boss trying to fix it, Gwyn decided the only way to fix the problem was to give the first flame a source of fuel to keep it lit. Himself. But he knew this would eventually burn away, leaving him a sort of hollow himself. Somewhat ironically, as no one would otherwise ever go hollow besides a human. So he also used his authority over humans and the Church of Thurland to set up a fake quest to get the undead to journey to Anorlando. Knowing humans would naturally desire power to sustain themselves in an Age of Dark, this was a perfect way to trick humans into keeping the first flame lit, and to keep the gods in power for as long as possible. But this couldn't last forever. 
In the game, you have to kill a lot of powerful opponents and take their souls to have enough power to equal what Gwen's power once was, and open the doors to the killing of the first flame. Nido has to die. The Witch of Isleth has to die. That's two Lord Souls already. Seath, who was gifted a piece of Gwyn's soul, has to die. The four kings, human lords of what used to be the greatest human city, who were also gifted segments of Gwyn's soul, have to die too. That's a lot. And it's barely enough to keep the flame going. Now that all those characters are gone after that point, after the video game, who would you kill to fuel the flame the future? Not a lot of options, are there? Maybe just a ton of humans? But would a Dark Wraith, a human that preys on other humans to keep their own humanity, actually want to rekindle the first flame? Probably not. And that's the whole point of the game's story. At the very end of Dark Souls 1, you're confronted with the question, do you keep the beautiful lie of a sunlit, beautiful world going, or do you embrace the future, the undeniable future, of a ruined and dark world, absent of life, death and purpose beyond a very long, heaving survival of the fittest, the most murderous? After all, humans in the Age of Dark grow more powerful the more they kill other humans. So if you ever accidentally die, you have to take someone else's life to regain what you lost. That's the point of invasions. And some people may murder you simply to grow outrageously powerful. The only way to protect yourself from someone that strong would be to become a humanity-stealing dark wraith yourself. That's the future of the world. An endless war between humans, thieving one another's souls in an effort to protect their own. The only way to stop it all is to either kill every last thing in the universe besides yourself and just be real careful where you walk for the next hojillion years, or for someone to willingly burn themselves in the first flame and choose a better life in a lie. This weakens the Dark Soul and stops the undead curse and prevents the undead from ever being reborn. It may also uh, outright kill the undead that are existing already, it's not really clear. But that all happens until the flame weakens again, which it inevitably will. All of it works together. It's somewhat complicated, but pretty well laid out in the game. If you've never played the game before and listened to me explain all that, it probably makes no sense, but don't worry about it. Dark Souls 1 was made to be a complete experience with a few missing holes. Just like Miyazaki's experience reading English fantasy novels, he couldn't fully translate. But unfortunately, FromSoft signed a contract for two more Dark Souls games. So they had to make two more sequels to a game that had a definitive ending. Either you link the flame for another 1,000 years of lies, at which point you're probably out of options, or you get the new reality going right away, embracing the truth that all things end. In either ending, they still end. When 2 was announced, people assumed it would be a prequel, because made no sense that one would have a sequel at worst, and it would be inappropriate to devalue its messaging at best. After all, Dark Souls DLC was already a prequel, and there was an original Curse of the Undead that Gwyn and the Knights fought against that we never saw. But instead, 2 was a sequel. It introduced a lot of bizarre, unrelated concepts. Hollowing Now didn't happen when you die so much as when you just don't realize your goals, or something a little more vague than that. Also, the finito are a thing, people with nido soul, like how humans have dark souls and gods have light souls and witches have life souls. I guess skeletons weren't good enough? I don't know. More importantly, too, was also very adamant on two main points. The first is the idea that the whole universe is an endless cycle that you absolutely can't stop no matter what, that will result in endless dark soul sequels for all time. When the first flame dies, it just relights itself for some reason because fuck you. We need more sequels. Fuck you. The second point came with the Scholar re-release and was the idea that Gwen was maybe responsible for the Undead Curse. It's all tied up in the idea of the first sin, which the game doesn't actually elaborate on in any meaningful way. There's a lot of finger pointing about sin in 2, but not much explanation. 
The general thought is that it's implied that Gwen somehow caused undeath, which, if you listen to my long-winded explanation of the first game just now, makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Neither of those points make any sense in the context of the first game. There is no cycle, and Gwen has nothing to do with how the soul's natures work. Dark Souls 3 was Miyazaki mainly attempting to make a best-of game that brought in elements from all the games, while also being a strange cousin to Bloodborne. It seems pretty evident that he didn't really want to make it, and that he had nothing to say about the universe beyond what he had already said. The story is far more convoluted in how it dictates information about its world. There are angels, for god knows what reason, a heavy focus on paintings, and the introduction of a gigantic city of pygmy lords, even though Gwen absolutely would have crushed any such thing in the past, I cannot begin to try to make sense out of it, beyond acknowledging there wasn't much left to explore in the universe besides the motivations of Kath and Frampt, which Dark Souls 3 never even really mentions anyway. I think in some misguided effort to make sense out of the idea posited in Scholar, Dark Souls 3 also implies that Gwen placed the dark sign, the sign of hollowing from the first game, onto humans. Somehow, it's, it's not explained at all. And that he created the undead curse. Sort of. For some reason. I don't know. Let me, let me go on a side tangent run. My favorite example of how dumb 3 can be is the Nameless King. And I know you like the Nameless King, don't worry. And one, Gwen had a son he disowned. Something about the annals of history, it doesn't really matter. He has a statue you can reconstruct, technically, via 3D modeling. And he looks like some dork, he's just some guy. And three, he is the Nameless King. And he loves dragons, and they love him. More importantly, he looks very similar to his dad. Because how could you know he's Gwen's son unless he looks like Gwen? Never mind that his his daughter and his uh, son, who he trained to be a, another daughter, I don't know, uh, they look nothing like him, but fuck that. Uh, right? My favorite part, though, is that he has a hollow face. Like the, na the nameless king, Gwen's son, has a hollow face like he's going undead. Which, if you remember isn't even possible. The only time a non-human has ever exhibited any sign of hollowing was because Gwyn was literally burning his own soul intentionally to keep the first flame going. That's why he looks like that. His son, then, would just look like some guy. There's no reason for him to have a hollow face other than the player is a dumb chimp that scratches his thick monkey cranium and can't recognize the guy unless he looks exactly like the final boss of one, but cooler. It's like Picard's old photo in Star Trek Nemesis, I recently rewatched that, showing him as being a bald teenager because we're too stupid to recognize he used to have hair and that Shinzon is a bad man. But yeah, you could rationalize why Gwen Sun has a hollow face by inventing an explanation like gods turn into raisins as they get weaker or something. But that's the point. The sequel tries to retcon or recontextualize the original. Gods don't hollow or die in one. At all. They can be killed, but their powers only grow weaker as their souls do. That's it. There's no evidence for anything beyond that. Point being in explaining all that is that to this day, I'll still get messages on YouTube in my comments of people correcting my quote-unquote mistakes in explaining the lore of the first game by attempting to fuse the bizarre logic and writing from the later games into the original. Even though said logic makes no sense in the first game, it did not even exist as an idea when it was written. It is similar to that first Star Wars movie. When the first Star Wars movie was made, a lot of ideas didn't exist at the time, so when someone asks, why did Obi-Wan call him Darth like that? That's weird. There are two answers people give. One of them is the real answer. This is the extrinsic answer, the behind-the-veil answer. When I take in media, I tend to view it from this position. Maybe because I'm an analytical asshole, I don't know. It's why I might laugh when a bunch of people get murdered in a silly way in a movie. It's not because I'm a psycho, it's because I'm thinking about how silly it is 
that the writer chose to make up this make-believe ridiculous murder spree. I'm not actually thinking about it in like an immersive state. Some people can't separate themselves from the immersion of media and view everything as intrinsically as possible. Which isn't really a mistake, it's actually pretty advantageous to be able to do that. So, to answer that question, Obi-Wan calls him Darth, because in the first movie, that's what his name was, and that's it. That's the actual answer. Other people will get particularly huffy when you try to explain things like this. Their answer is that Obi-Wan was ridiculing his old friend Anakin by calling him by his title and some effort to demean him for some reason, even though he's an enlightened Jedi who would want to draw him back to the light side and Vader probably wouldn't give a shit and clearly was not even phased by it. But no, shut up. It's because it was psychological warfare or something. Not because the writer hadn't decided on stuff yet and the movie was written in a different context back in the 1970s. No, 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 it's not because of that at all. No, it a, it's a dumb theory I thought up as a 12-year-old in uh, 1998. Uh, this is the problem I have with the it can't ruin the original logic. People like to throw around anytime this problem comes up. The issue isn't that the original is being altered. Obviously, it's not. It's not at all. The, the problem is that people's perception of the context of the original is being warped into something that was never true. Gwen Denton calls the undead curse. He never did. That's fucking stupid. Makes no sense. And directly conflicts with not only how the universe works, but his motivations as a character. The same kind of person that tries to correct you on this is going to be the same kind of person that gets angry at you for claiming that Obi-Wan thought Vader's first name was Darth at the time it was written. Context is important, and context erodes over time. Dark Souls 1 had its own story, its own setting. It was complete when it was written. It, it had as much information in it as Miyazaki thought it needed to have, and that is it. Dark Souls 2 is not a sequel. It's a bastardized copy of the original's ideas for the sake of making a rush sequel that was contractually obligated. Dark Souls 3 was also obligated, but also an attempt to band-aid everything together in a vague package. It heavily referenced 1, surreptitiously tried to fix 2, while barely mentioning it ever even happened because, you know, fan reception. All too obviously tried to be Bloodborne's combat without being Bloodborne's combat. All to make the most complete, yet inoffensive to the majority package possible for the time that it was made. It's why when someone asks for an explanation of something from the Dark Souls series, I have to ask them which game they're referring to. Because they're all set in their own universe, with their own internal logic, like it or not even if they do claim to be sequels. You can't apply 3's logic to 1, and you can't apply 2's logic to 1. Context. Context is important. Even if I'm wrong and Miyazaki says, no, I totally wanted that Gwen thing to be true in 1, or whatever it is. It was a mistranslation. Ghost, Ghost took it. They took the item description. Ghost came into my office and they flew away. It, it doesn't matter if I'm wrong, because even Miyazaki has said, along with many great writers for that matter, that you don't elaborate on pieces of the story you leave blank. Those are for the reader to fill on their own. When you fill those blanks with what you originally thought or what you think now, you ruin the experience for someone somewhere while adding very little to the experience. Unless, of course, you're saying the butchers and the undead bird were all women in a radio interview. That's great. That's okay. I'll also flatly state that I could be wrong about a huge amount of details in this video. I can't do much research right now because all I have is phone LTE that just stops working sometimes. My memories and my current levels of anxiety. Uh, maybe the Darth thing is badly informed. Maybe there's a single item description in Dark Souls 1 that disproves everything. You know, whatever it is. Uh, that's fine, because I hope you can see the point I'm driving towards either way. When you experience something for the first time, it's a flashpoint of context. The more material you try to add to that context, even something like this video, then the more you muddy it. Even this video is guilty of altering the perception of the original versions of the things that I'm talking about. Part of studying history at all, dumb video game history or real history, is trying to figure out motivations and context for why things happened as they did. I'm not going to go over the innumerable examples of this, but most of history 
is people from contemporary records seeing what happened in the past through the lens of their own perceptions. People who want to romanticize the past, or vilify it, will do so without any regard to what actually happened or why. Future generations will accept this explanation as facts and fail to learn from the past. And then future historians have to clean up the mess by unearthing what little they can about what was actually true. And even this can be lost. So even though real history is way more important than some dumb game, I hope you can see why I always think about this problem when I play Final Fantasy VII. Oh, did you, did you think I forget that's what this video was allegedly about? Well, I did. Shut up. FF7 was a really weird game when it was made. I suggest looking up a documentary or two about it. But the gist of it is that it was narrative gumbo. It didn't have a writer, exactly. It had tons of ideas being tossed around at a changing team of writers and developers. It was in constant flux, and people were inserting their own assets and concepts all the time. The fact that it coalesced into something that made any sense at all is, quite frankly, astonishing. This is why, when people remark that Remake had Seven's original writers on board, I have a hearty laugh. That's not really how it was written, in their own words. Even if Seven was written by Mr. Paul F. Seven, Paul would be returning to ideas he had back in the mid-1990s. He would have completely changed as a person. His ideas would be totally different. His perception of the world would be new. His memories of what he was even doing in 1995 or so and why would be totally different. It was always impossible to make a perfect recreation of Seven, Paul F. Seven or not. That's a problem for all art. It's a moment in time. A photo of the image of the person and thoughts you once were in that moment. You can't go back to it. You can only recontextualize, evolve, or emulate it. Considering FF7 was basically created out of a tornado of ideas, it's no wonder that 8 fell on its face in a lot of ways. They couldn't recapture that lightning in a bottle. It's also no wonder why contemporary Square Enix executives admit that 7's success made them incredibly arrogant and foolish, which resulted in Spirits Within essentially ruining the company and causing the Enix merger. That, in turn, would slowly poison the company into the Toriyama era of 13 and beyond. And that's an era they're still in. It's only being heavily propped up by the money that Yoshi P is hauling into their offices through 14's success and his genius. And 14 was a colossal failure of its own, again primarily because of company cultural issues of them refusing to heed advice from outside of the company. But I digress. Point being, FF7's success was somewhat accidental in many ways that are incredibly difficult to analyze. Especially 30 years later in the West. The motivations of its writing are equally unsound. So many people on the staff had so many ideas for their own reasons, and all that credit is being carried away via Tornado in the same way my internet dish is likely transplanted someplace in Indiana by now. That's why it was so hard to remake as a game. Not because the writers were different, or even because they had changed as people. It's because a lot of FS7's success stemmed from its reception. You see, one thing I've talked about in a lot of my videos is the idea that the most effective way to write is to allow viewers to project themselves into the story with you. The more you encourage participation with your prose, the more people will see what they want to see. That's why a vague description of something beautiful can be more effective than a long-winded one that tries to paint a very particular picture of what the author thinks is beautiful. It's why famous people can be seen as villains or heroes. Hell, it's, it's why a text message to your girlfriend that just says hi can result it with a response of what the fuck is that supposed to mean? Are you angry at me? What the hell's going on? People do a lot of projecting because our worlds are internal. It's how we think. We don't see the world. We see the world of our senses and our senses are flawed. That's why you should write to encourage people to project themselves into making their own stories rather than lecturing to them about yours. That's very difficult to do naturally, but it can happen accidentally sometimes, just like it did with Final Fantasy VII. 
When the compilation era came around and Seven started getting a lot of expanded content, there were a lot of deserved complaints about the tone, the character writing, the action, and so on. It was made out of era from the original, with different teams and goals. Making a CGI movie is a very different enterprise compared to the simple 2D sprite-inspired 3D models of the original game. You can read whatever emotion you want to onto a lot of these little goofy models. You can read a lot of character from the text. The more realistic you get, the more constrained perception becomes. Cloud in the original game begins as an asshole that only cares about money and himself. He's always picking fights and rejecting the people around him. Over time, he softens to the idea of saving the planet, becomes obsessed with chasing Sephiroth, realizes he's being controlled, and sort of shuts down as a person shortly after Ares dies. Even after realizing he was always a mediocre person, and he had just been projecting his fantasy of imitating Zack for most of the game, he's still sort of a cringy goofball. He tries to be a leader, but he's still suffering from this phantom of his past weakness. In the compilation, he acts more like Squall. He's brooding, quiet, serious, and a loner, which... No matter what point in the story you were in Seven, he was never like that at any point. Eris was also transformed into a quiet, sweet, shrine maiden archetype character, when in reality she was obsessed with new experiences, having fun, and actually had a minor dark streak about her. I could go on, you get the idea. Even right after the game came out, the compilation sequel ideas were very poorly received because they did not match the original writing at all and were too concerned with referencing anime and Japanese cultural icons like Gact. When Remake was announced, that was what people were worried the most about. The developers not understanding the original and trying to insert modernized, Japanese market-focused nonsense and fanfiction into the story. Which is exactly what happened. But they also got the characters right. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. More so by far than the compilation era games did. My favorite character from the original seven may have been Eris just because she was so fun-loving, but also strange and caring. I honestly wasn't too attached to most of the characters. My favorite character in all seven media, though, is Remake's version of Barrett. What a beautiful, ridiculous man. I love Remake Barrett. In my opinion, they fully realized who he was in the original game, but then expanded on it in the best way possible, which is what I wanted from the game. The same, but much more without offense. I can say that they accomplished this with almost all of the characters. Eris also, although now she's Aerith because the Japanese don't actually have a TH sound, but they still want her name to look like an English word while simultaneously calling her Eresu, because it sounds nice. We get the uglier sounding name because fuck us and fuck you too. Anytime I say Eris these days, I'm talking about the original character. When I talk about Eris, I'm talking about the compilation and remake. But she was way, way better realized than she was in the compilation as well. She's exactly as I envisioned her, minus one or two things. Her wall market dress is fancy and elegant, while in the original... She was dressing in the sluttiest, hot bitch red dress she could find, because fuck yeah, it's time to party, and fuck up some shit. They didn't really seem to get that part, or they didn't care, but that's just one minor example. It's mainly the ridiculous obsession with Sephiroth and the moronic time ghosts that come with the most total bastardizations of the characters in the writing. I knew... This was, this was the moment. I knew the game was in a lot of trouble. The moment that Aerith's introduction scene starts. And a character introduction is very important. Being able to introduce the character and immediately know who they are and what they're about is incredibly vital. It starts for her, perhaps the most important character in the story. But time figuratively freezes, and Sephiroth steps out from behind her 
to let Cloud know that Marketing Boy is back. <gasps> it's Marketing Lad, guys. <gasps> and he's there to kiss Cloud, guys. What? No, no, who fucking cares about introducing Aerith? You've all, you've all played Seven, right? Fuck her. Look, look, Sephi and Cloud Chan, they're gonna kiss. They're gonna kiss. In the script, I typed that part in all caps and with four exclamation marks, by the way. By the end of the game, there are scenes that definitely feel personally pinned by Nomura because all the characters' personalities shut off. They all start talking in riddles about the nature of fate and the future, and everyone feels like a sock puppet that is turning to another sock puppet to ask a prompting question so a character can run their fucking mouth about nonsense or time travel, or their thoughts on the nature of being. While some interviews state that all the writing decisions to turn the game into a bad fanfic were done by committee, other interviews say that no, Nomura handled most of the finer details of the core story. It's hard to tell what's true since they're so vague about it, but when the dog takes a shit, I know it was from the dog. I can smell Nomura writing. I know how defensive people can get about Nomura, but jokes aside, he's honestly one of the worst writers I've ever seen. He doesn't need to be writing anything, anywhere. I know that because, because of Kingdom Hearts and because they know that people will buy things, like they'll buy anything if it has anything to associate it with all the compilations associated with it, that's the reason why he's there. Like, that's the only reason why he's there, because they know money. It doesn't matter how good it is, just money. His main weapon is cryptic pretense. Not Dark Souls' absence and evaluation, but overt mediocrity. Remember that reader projection method I was talking about? His is the most toxic methodology to applying it. It's like a gotcha game for words. With every game you banner roll for explanations, you'll never get, because the core experience never meant anything other than to keep you engaged with nothing and spending money. I'd always wanted the remake to be way more than the original, not a one-to-one -one remake. I would have even have been fine with it being a time travel story about making a better future than the one that we got in 7 if they had 1. only been more honest about that in their marketing, and 2. if it had been better written. Nomura and anyone else supporting that writing style, they need to leave. I will not apologize for stating that incredibly obvious facts. Still, fair is fair. Just like the original 7 succeeded by accidentally having too many writers, Remake failed, sort of, accidentally by having too many of the wrong kind of writers. It was definitely a product of the times and the wrong kind of the evaluation of the merits of the original. Did it ruin the original game? No, of course not. However, did it ruin how people understand the original? <laughs> oh yeah, it did that. Just like Dark Souls 2 and 3 ruined how people understand Dark Souls 1, just like how decades of Star Wars have ruined our ability to see Star Wars itself in a vacuum of its own weird, original little world. Just like how just being alive ruins your understanding of the past. It's just what happens. Remake definitely obliterated a lot of the content of the original. Let me give you a great example of this. Did you know? There was a theory for a long time after the game came out that Sephiroth, outside of the calm flashback, never really existed. Some of you some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about already. It may be more accurate to say that Sephiroth had died way before the game takes place and never actually came back. Now, I'm not saying that this is true. I'm just elaborating on this to make a point on how differently people viewed the game in the 90s. The idea is that when Sephiroth was luxuriating and having found in Free Genova and Nibelheim, after dispatching Tifa and Zack, Cloud gets the jump on him, just like you see in the game once Cloud recalls his true memories. He's impaled by Sephiroth, but manages to fling him into the reactor and the live stream. The theory is that this straight up kills Sephiroth. His consciousness gets absorbed into the live stream like everyone else's does. It's one of the reasons why you don't go down there. He doesn't turn into a Time Lord, or whatever the fuck's going on there. When we see half of his remains later on crystallized in the, uh, the crater, that's just a corpse. You might be wondering who the hell we're talking to is, then, for most of the game. Well, the answer to that is Genova. I don't know if it's intentional, but I always like to explain Genova like this. 
It's basically the thing from John Carpenter's uh, 1982 film. Just like the movie, Genova is an alien that crashed into the frozen wastelands. It was unearthed by people and started to assimilate them. As the game says, it took the appearance of the people it attacked. It's why, when it was found by Shinra, they thought it was a Cetra. The thing that you see in the tube, in the, the, the cutscenes in the game, that woman, that, that female-looking creature, was probably the last victim it had taken over. That's not what Genova actually is. That used to be a person. The last person that it was either in the middle of absorbing or transforming out of to try to fight the Citra that had found it. It got frozen in the ice and then later on Earth. So, like the thing, it's able to sublimate people entirely. It becomes you. I'm not saying they're one-to-one -one and behave the same way, just that this is a good way of looking at it. To make more sense of it. That's how Genova generally works. If you cut off a piece of it, it acts as its own organism. The Genova bosses you fight in the game are little pieces that the fake Sephiroth leaves behind to occupy you. Whenever he flies away in the cutscenes, you can actually see like a little bitty tendril fall down. Uh, when you put its cells in the people, it can almost control them like puppets and reshape their bodies. It's why Cloud is able to be manipulated into hurting Eris and stealing the Black Materia, and why all the clones are returning for a reunion with Genova. You don't actually fight Genova, presumably, until you get to its absolute synthesis form in the crater. And according to this theory, whenever you actually fight Sefer Sephiroth, or Sefer Sephiroth, whatever it's supposed to be, then that also is Genova in some form, within uh, whatever remains of Sephiroth. So the idea is that, in the entire game, you never fight the Sephiroth from Cloud's childhood, because he's been dead for years. It's all Genova. Genova is just using Sephiroth's body as a template, because he's essentially a clone child of Hojo and Genova's cells, carried by Lucretia Crescent. He would be the perfect host, with the perfect body, with the ambition to join his mother in her goal to assimilate all energy of a planet before leaving to find a new world. Because she is essentially just that. She's an organism that only does one thing. Goes to new planets, absorbs what it can there, and then leaves. Sort of like Lavos. Okay, now. Uh, I was always iffy on this theory. I thought it didn't play into the themes of the story if the whole thing was played out by an uncaring monster that had no real ambition or motivation beyond consuming the planet and leaving. However, the idea that of that theory being taken seriously at all these days is laughable. And that's because Sephiroth is so incredibly present in every facet of post-7 material. He's like Darth Vader in that respect. He became so marketably iconic to that franchise that he turned into Space Jesus. His recognition became more important than the story he was in. That's why I call him Marketing Boy, because he doesn't even have a motivation or character anymore. He just talks dramatically and obsesses over Cloud for no real reason other than he needs to be there. He's famous, so there he is. He died. Cloud killed him personally in a fight that may have never happened outside of his own mind, because it was meant to represent how Cloud had at least obliterated the demons of his past weakness, and risen to be more than he was, and more than what Sephiroth, his old hero, ever offered him. But no, Marketing Boy is back to beat you up to uh, make some more yen for Squeenix. He's the final boss of Remake. He'll be the final boss of Remake 2, maybe? Then the final boss of the third one? The fourth one? Will anyone care? I'm, I'm seriously thinking that when we get to the crater again, in this bizarre bastard zombie story, that we'll actually be able to make a party of Zack, Aerith, and a clone good Sephiroth who wants to help us because you freed him from his fate via time travel and he's a good marketing boy now. And we just fight another Sephiroth who's like an interdimensional time angel for like the tenth time. Does anyone does anyone care who cares? I'm I'm being serious too. Like I actually think that's probably what they're gonna do. Anyway, the way people viewed Seven was pretty different than it is now. That's the point. So the original is still there, as they say. Is the original still there? Yes, it is. Star Wars is still there, Dark Souls is still there. Final Fantasy VII is still there. The Godfather 1 and 2 are still there. 
Jaws is still there. Harry Potter, pre-you knowing that shit, is still there. Caddyshack is still there. Sonic the Hedgehog is still there. Halloween is still there. They're all still there. But the context isn't. Because life is always moving, and we're always changing. And the cultural perception of those things changes with it. And the more that the new recontextualizes the old, the harder it is to recall what the old even meant when it was new. Especially if you weren't there to see it. So, can you ruin the original? Yes, you absolutely can. Not because the tornado destroys your house. Because the tornado turned your house into a prison. It's the same thing you had, but with another context. And context changes as the world changes. Please be careful how you change the world. Be critical, be kind. See you guys next time.